Believers, we're so excited on this upcoming weekend. We will be observing on Sunday, May the 3rd, our second annual communion. We're excited in this season. We're not waiting to come back into our physical building. We're going to have our second, this is historical for the city of joy, virtual communion. So that means that those persons who support us and you're with us and city of joy, we're encouraging you this week. If you can go out to the grocery store, if you're not in our immediate area and you can grab some juice, grab some crackers. And on this Sunday after I minister, we will partake in the Lord's Supper together. To all of the City of Joy Nation that is local in the DMV, we want to let you know that on this Saturday, the 2nd of May, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the City of Joy campus, we will be distributing pre-packaged communion kits. We will have a drive through for you to pick up pre-packaged communion kits. Deacons will be there to receive you so that you can receive it. Remember, we are following the laws of the land. Our awesome Governor Hogan is leading us through this process. And so when you come, you need to have your PPP on, PPE on. They're going to extend to you the communion kit of what you need, and you're going to receive one anointed oil that has been consecrated for over 40 days. And you're going to anoint your front door, your back door, anoint yourself and the rooms in your house. So we look forward, believers of the City of Joy, of seeing you not only Saturday for those picking up your prepackaged communion kits, but all of our persons who connect with our church on our virtual communion on YouTube and Facebook as we lift up the name of God through eating his body and drinking his blood. Be blessed. Welcome City of Joy Nation and to all of our online community and to all of our awesome, amazing friends of our members. We're excited uh, about going in the word of God on this Wednesday, lifting up the name of God and learning and studying the things of Jesus. I want to encourage you to grab your pad, your pen, uh, grab your iPad, your iPhone, your highlighter. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of material today because we're talking about discipleship and it has a impact with and through suffering. That's what we're going to look at. First of all, we must uh, mention our MV. What's the MV, Pastor, going into this, fall, this upcoming week? The MV is Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And I pray that you've been keeping up with us. And that verse reads, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. Don't forget, disciples, your scripture reading, your weekly reading should begin around Acts chapter 5, verse 26 through 30. And we always remember that we exclude Sunday as our day of worship and Wednesday we exclude because we're getting in the word together. Grab your Bibles, call your friends. Uh, if you need to push me on pause, because I'm going to give you a lot of information. We got a lot of ground to cover today. Push pause, write information down, come back to it. But we're going to start with Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. And it says, Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor uh, men like him. Okay? Uh, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give him. So today we're going to focus on Jesus not only as our master, not only as our savior, but Jesus is our friend even in suffering. I know we don't like the term suffering, and some people feel like it's strange to mention suffering, but the truth is the blessings that you and I have received, we received it through the sufferings that Jesus Christ himself Endured. Let's start in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 
um, 14. And I'm going to give you words at times so you can write down. And I want you to define these words in your tablet because God is going to really minister something into your spirit uh, as it relates to disciples and suffering. Verse 14 of chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, highlight high priest, who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we Profess A couple of things I want to mention out of this first verse um, that we're studying in verse 14. It says that Jesus is the great high priest. Notice the unique character of Jesus. He is the high priest. There is no other high priest that was called great in the Bible. Write that down. No other high priest that was called great in the Bible. And it says who has gone through the heavens. There was no other high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. So, so what is that verse saying about the unique character of Jesus? That Jesus is our great high priest, great high priest, not just regular, not average. Matter of fact, anything that Jesus does is great. And that's why you know greatness is in you because Jesus laid his hands on you. So he's our great high priest. He passed through heaven, which means he ascended through the heavens to take the right seat beside God. And there he's operating as our high priest by doing what? He's interceding for you and he's interceding for me even right now. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without what? Sin. Highlight the word without sin. So Jesus is a high priest who can identify with us because we know that Jesus was divinity. He was a part of the triune in Genesis that said, let us make man. But in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he added through the birth of Mary humanity on his divinity or on his deity for what purpose? He added that so he could live among us. And by him living among us, he's able to say, listen, I've experienced the human experience so that when you call on me, when you reach out to me, I understand because just like you were tempted, I was tempted. Matter of fact, the truth is that he was tempted in a far greater way than we will ever understand through temptation because there was no sin in him and nor did he ever succumb to sin in any capacity. Let's look at verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So he says, listen, you're going to have grace because really I'm your great high priest. I understand the human experience. And when you call me, I don't look down on you, but I have a level of understanding, a level of compassion that identify with the human experience. And so you need to understand that grace is important to the life of a believer. Grace does not ignore uh, God's justice. It operates in fulfillment of God's justice because of the light that came from the cross. So there are times as believers that you have done wrong, you strayed away, but you ought to thank God more than anybody because God's grace, because God's grace allows God to see the cross and so when Jesus was on the cross, he took the penalty that we should have been in uh, enduring uh, with death, hell, the grave and some levels of suffering. So when Jesus went through the pain of the cross, it was so that you and I could have the grace of God because God's justice really demanded payment for sin. 
Glory to God. And that's powerful even by itself. And so when you read this passage, you understand that Jesus experienced life. He experienced the humanity. Why? So he can identify with you and I. Is just through life? No. But even through the rough points of his life. Go to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter uh, Hebrews chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse 7. And I'm reading from the NIV, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and if you got the KJV, just stick, stick with us. Uh, it says, verse 7, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was what? Heard. So, when Jesus was here, he prayed. That's why you and I pray. We offer up prayers. And he offered up petitions. And he had loud cries and tears to save him from the death he was heard uh, by God. Now, it's important because that verse ends up by saying, uh, who could save him from death as he was heard because of his reverent submission. That's what the NIV says, reverent submission. Write that down. I want you to uh, study those two words, reverent submission. See, when Jesus came to this earth, he knew that he came for a mission. He came for a particular purpose. And mission is important because we discussed that last week in Luke chapter 4. He had a mission to help the broken, to mend the brokenhearted, to, to help those who were captive, to, to minister to those that were poor and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So when he was here, the agony of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying, God, take this cup from me, yet nevertheless, not as I will, but Lord, let your will be done, it proved a point, and I need you to write this down. It proved the point that Jesus Christ struggled with the difficulty of obedience. You need to write that down. He obeyed perfectly, but he struggled with the difficulty of obedience. He struggled. And, and I think that's a good point because, believers, you need to understand that you can have a struggle and still obey God perfectly. Because sometimes we get the misconception that, that, that in order to obey God, you, you have to be perfect. No, sometimes you may struggle. Sometimes you may have an understanding of what you need to do, but you have a season before you do it. Sometimes you have a war going on, as Paul say, on the inside about, I should say it, but I don't want to be offensive to anybody when in fact you do need to say it because he's called you to say it. Because as believers, you have a right. There's sometimes you do have to stand down. But as believers, there's sometimes you got to stand up. Uh, you got to speak loud and spare not. You have to share the good things of Jesus Christ. And in the process of doing that, you may have struggles, but you still can obey God obediently. I think that's a very good point. Now, notice when you see the word uh, prayer and supplication in verse, uh, verse 7, the word prayers and supplication, you got to understand that in the Greek, that is the word high criteria. And this word means olive branch wrapped up in wool. Olive branch, write that down, that is wrapped up in wool. Because that is what the ancient Greek, Greek worshipers held and waved to express their desperate prayer and desire. Um, they would have an olive branch in, in wool, and if they were waving it, it meant that they had a desperate prayer, not just a regular prayer. They had desperate desires. And this supplication took place when Jesus was in the Garden of Olives. Jesus himself was the wool because... He was the Lamb of God. And so when he was talking to God desperately, Lord, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but let thy will be done. And believers, when you struggle, that's important for you to understand. Though you struggle, you still can obey God perfectly. 
Okay, let's look at verse number eight. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. How like that? Lord, that ministers to my spirit. He learned obedience from what he suffered. Now, this is a revelation here because this verse actually tells me that there were some things that Jesus needed to learn when he was on earth. <laughs> Doesn't that blow your mind for him to be in heaven, to be God, the son, to be deity? When he came in this world, he had to experience sufferings because there were certain things he needed to learn about obedience through suffering. Now notice this, this gets a little tricky. He did not need to learn to obey. He needed to learn what was involved in obedience. And there are certain things about obedience that you can't learn from looking at somebody else. And so he had to come closer to man, put on human tissue, experience the life, experience the challenges. We talked about some things on last uh, uh, Wednesday's lesson because there were certain things he could not learn by observing. There were certain things he had to experience to learn. Glory to God. And I know sometimes believers, you say, well, why do I have to experience this, Pastor? Why do I have to go through this? Maybe he wants you to learn something through what you're going through so you can help other people. And so when you're going through a level of suffering, don't despise it. Use suffering as a tool uh, of instruction in your life. God can direct you through suffering. Not, not that he's always disciplining you, but many times he's teaching you through the sufferings that you're going through. Look at verse number nine, and we're going to end with uh, this particular passage. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation of all who obey him. So once he went through his suffering, then he was made to become the source of our eternal salvation, which means that God had to send Jesus through this process so that we could benefit. And I mentioned this as a, as a believer, when you go through things, it's not all for you. I think you're being very selfish with your struggle if you think every struggle is just about what you want and what you're going through. The goal of a struggle is not only to help you, but put you in a position so you can help somebody who's coming along beside you or coming along behind you in Jesus' name. Now watch this. We're going to go a little bit further. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, because Jesus calls us to suffer. And one of the areas that's important um, from disciples' perspective is that disciples have not cornered the market of understanding Jesus in the area of suffering. People suffer. But a Christian should suffer differently than somebody else. Because the world looks at suffering as something is just not right, something is wrong, and they worry about their response to suffering. While people who are of the faith, who's been born again, who's been washed in the blood, filled with the precious spirit of God, we should suffer purposefully rather than suffering like the world. And the greatest person in the whole Bible other than Jesus who can teach us about suffering is the Apostle Paul. Because Paul went through so many things and his ministry really helped me, as well as you, to deal with the sufferings we endure. Chapter 3 of Philippians. And let's start at verse uh, number 7. But whatever was to my profit, now consider loss for the sake of Christ. So Paul is saying now, he's saying what was considered to my profit. He's saying that any of the corrupted teachers of my time, his time, would have loved to be able to brag and boast if they had Paul's pedigree. 
Paul was a learned man. He was an educated man. But he says that for the sake of the gospel, I now consider it loss. He said the gains of what other people would look at and say they are gains, I'm going to count them as a loss. Now the question comes, if they were a loss, Pastor, uh, were these things harmful to Paul? No, no. Getting an education wasn't harmful. Um, being a learned person is not harmful. But Paul says that these were things uh, which Paul sought to please God in the energies of his flesh. So Paul says, listen, before I became a Christian, these were the things I thought about because I thought that success in life came through the efforts of my flesh because I was trying to please God through works. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, but now I'm starting to understand that I have to value the things of God more than I value the things of the world. Look at verse 8. What is more I consider, everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Highlight that. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, it's a lot of uh, 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 gems that we need to talk about. He says, first of all, when I talk about loss, I'm showing you I consider things lost because I'm putting at this point in my life a personal relationship with Jesus Christ at the very center of my Christian life. And I think that's very important, ladies and gentlemen, that you and I have to put our relationship with Jesus Christ at the forefront. There's nothing wrong with accomplishing this. There's nothing wrong with achieving that. But the forefront of your passions and your pursuit should be your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why Paul writes in this particular verse, my Lord, personal, my Lord. And look what he calls those things that he considered gains at one point. He called them rubbish. Highlight the word rubbish and then write it down. See, rubbish in ancient Greek um, was used for one or two issues. One, it would describe the excrement from the human body. Or it would describe table scraps that nobody wanted to eat but they would give to the dogs for food. And I think Paul would classify his rubbish to mean either one of those two meanings because Paul was simply saying, my relationship with Jesus comes before anything else. And that's why Matthew chapter 6 says, if ye seek ye first the kingdom of God, oh God, and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto thee. Uh, Matthew is saying the same thing Paul is saying. Your relationship with God should come first. Somebody say, come first. Look at verse uh, number, uh, number nine. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. And so Paul says, listen, that there's a part of your life and your walk with God that some of the things you thought were important as you grow in God, guess what you're going to find out? They're not as important as you thought. And anything that you have to weigh against your personal relationship with God, your relationship with God should outweigh any other thing. Go to Colossians chapter 1. And I pray you're enjoying the word of God. We love the word of God at the city of joy because the Bible says man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Colossians chapter one, I'm going to start at verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is what? the church. You see, Paul wrote this from a Roman jail. He was able to see his suffering as something that was working good for others. And he talked about his uh, suffering and he uses it, he says, still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. 
Now, one of the biggest mistakes when you read this passage, and most people make this mistake until you study uh, to show, show thyself approved, when you read the word Christ's afflictions, he's not talking about Christ's redemptive sufferings on Calvary's cross. No, 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 no. He doesn't look at that as afflictions. He's talking about ministerial sufferings. And Paul had experienced a lot of ministerial sufferings because he represented Jesus Christ. And when you represent Jesus Christ, you're going to be afflicted and deal with ministerial sufferings from, from people, uh, from family, from foes, because the devil will try to attack any man of God or woman of God who's standing on the word of God, representing God. You will suffer for the cause of Christ. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 25. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present you the word of God in its fullness. Paul said, listen, from jail, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me. Paul says, listen, I'm not doing this by my own initiative. I'm doing this according to the stewardship of God. God put me in the position to be able to minister to people. Paul says this from jail. He's preaching and ministering, but he says, I did not put myself in ministry. And that's a very challenge. When you put yourself in a place, then you're moving outside of the sanction of God. Paul says, no, I'm doing this because God commissioned me out of the stewardship of God. That's the reason why I'm preaching. He distributed a gift to me and I received the gift and I'm functioning in the gift even though I'm in prison. Look at verse 26. The mystery that has been kept hidden for all ages and generations, but is now disclosed to who? The saints. Highlight the word saints and highlight the word uh, mystery. Paul says, listen, it's a mystery to some. It's a mystery to some. And what is a mystery? A mystery is a truth that can be known by revelation, not by intuition. No. A mystery is a truth that can be known by revelation and not by intuition. Paul says, no, no, God revealed some things to me uh, through a revelation, and I share them. And persons who are not walking with God and don't have the revelation, they really don't understand how important suffering is to the progressiveness of ministry. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I want to begin reading at verse number 8. Verse 8 says, So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or be ashamed of me, his what? Prisoner. <laughs> but join with me in what? Suffering. Highlight suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now, I think this is very important because Paul is saying, listen, don't be ashamed of me. I'm, I'm, I'm a prisoner. Now, to you, you might say, well, pastor, that doesn't make sense. But it does because Remember, in the Bible times, it was hard for people to receive those who were following Jesus because it was hard for people who were not convicted by God to share with people that my Lord and Savior was crucified on Calvary because the only type of person who was crucified on Calvary was a criminal. So when you tell people that my Lord and Savior and Master was crucified on Calvary, they would look at you funny saying, why would a so-called God and somebody that you honor and reverence be crucified with prisoners and malefactors and die in the death of shame? Then for Timothy, Timothy would possibly struggle by telling people that my apostle is in prison. <laughs> So my savior died on the cross. My apostle is a prisoner. And so it would cause sometimes a person who didn't understand that suffering is a part of discipleship, they would become ashamed. No, I can't tell you that my apostle is behind bars and he's giving me words of encouragement through a letter because he's behind bars and my Lord and savior died on 
uh, Calvary's cross with male factors, the Bible calls them, and prisoners who've done wrong through a level of punishment. But Paul is saying, no, join me in my suffering. Don't be ashamed to tell people I'm in jail. Don't, don't keep that information. I want them to know that I'm in jail, but not for my sake, but for the gospel's sake. We have to get back to a place where we understand when you stand on the word of God and the word of God is good news, but the devil is intimidated when you start spreading good news of Jesus Christ in a time, in a day, in a culture in which we live in right now. Even with the coronavirus and all of the challenges, as a child of God and disciples, we need to stand up and stop standing down. We still have to say God is good. God is a keeper. God is one who will cover you. God will strengthen you during pandemics. And you already know this is not the last one. Some people say, well, no, this is, no, Jesus is getting ready. No, this is just the beginning. So as believers, you got to become a disciple and understand you have to gird up your loins of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation, get your shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. You are in war. We're in war and suffering is a part of it. Look at verse 10. He says, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who have destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through what? Through the gospel. Through the gospel. See, we have to get away from presenting this sanitized Jesus, this disinfected cross, making this Christianity that we walk with so safe. In Paul's day, suffering was a part of the order of the day. And when you stood for something, you was willing to suffer for what you believe. And Paul says that even though I'm in jail, I look at this, if I'm doing it for the Lord, because he's the Lord over every circumstance, then if I'm in prison, I'm not the prisoner of the Romans. And you read it when you hear Paul talks about prison. He says, I'm the Lord's prisoner. <laughs> Because I'm doing what God say do. He says, if I'm a free man, I'm the Lord's free man. And believers, I think you should get this in your spirit, that whatever you're going through, if you're suffering for the cause of Christ, you ought to have a smile on your face and you ought to embrace it. And you help even in this day and time to share the burdens with our fellow brothers and sisters who are suffering you can share the burden. How can you share somebody else's burden? Through prayer. When we pray for each other, we're sharing the burdens of our brothers and sisters. When you have a heart of concern for what's going on in our nation and what's going on in this state, then you are sharing the burden. When you, when you respond with wisdom and have wise actions, you're responding and you're helping to share the burden. Now, now I need you to understand this. Paul calls the gospel good news. Write that down, good news. It's good news, and the gospel is good news. It makes no difference what's going on right now in our community, our country, and the nation. It's good news that God thought about you and I before we even existed. It's good news that Jesus Christ came himself, put himself in a garment of humanity to be God amongst us. It's good news that he went to Calvary's cross to take our sins. It's good news that he demonstrated to us not only how to have life, but according to John chapter 10 around verse 10, but to have it more abundantly. And guess what? It's really good news that if you're born again, saved and sanctified, that he's given us eternal life. So regardless of what goes on around us, the gospel and this is what Paul was saying, is good news. And the question I have for you, are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to deal with persecution? Because the Bible says Paul was beaten, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was in prison, he was sleep deprived, he was hungry, he was thirsty, he was cold, and he was without adequate clothing. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 28. 
But I want you to read Psalms, uh, Philippians chapter 1. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. I think this is our last scripture. Are you hanging with me? I know we're rolling today, but I told you this lesson was going to be filled. This is our last scripture, Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to start reading at verse number 12. If you got it, say amen. Now I want you to know, brothers, what that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You need to highlight that. Mm -hmm. It advanced the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for who? For Christ. Verse 14. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged. <laughs> Glory to God. To speak the word of God more courageously and fearfully. Do you hear what Paul said? Paul said, since I've been in prison, people around me are getting encouraged. People who are standing for God, watch this, on the outside is being encouraged by the hell I'm going through on the inside. <laughs> people who are proclaiming the gospel are proclaiming it with more power because when they're hearing about I'm inside jail, but I'm still ministering. And he wants us to know that regardless of where you are, you might be in the hospital hearing my teaching today. You can still minister in the hospital. You might be behind bars and you're listening to this message. You can minister. You can start a revival in jail. You might be at home bedridden, but in a bedridden position, you can still encourage the nurses and those who come in there. Even in your situation where it looks like you're shut in, Paul said, you're not shut out. Get that cell phone. Start encouraging people with the word of God you're receiving right now. Tell them, listen, in the name of Jesus, I'm going through, but I'm still holding on to my faith. Encourage somebody in another state. And they say, well, how are you doing? Tell them, I'm holding on to God's unchanging hand because I'm a prisoner for the Lord. And no matter what I have, if I have to live a uh, in somebody else's room temporarily, I'm doing it for Jesus because I'm going to bounce back on my feet. If I've got to search for another job because things have transitioned, I'm still going to have the smile and I'm still going to have a testimony. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens who? Good God, my Father. And Paul says we have to have this same type of commitment and testimony. Don't withdraw from your participation in the work of the Lord because you're going through tough times. Continue it and use the sufferings that you go through to bring about the good, not only in your life, but in the life of others. Whatever God allows to come upon you, he will use it as a vehicle to draw people to him. Remember that. Whatever he allows you to go through, he's going to use it as a tool to allow people to draw to God. The circumstances in your life that has hindered you, that has bothered you, and even circumstances that may have frustrated you, the truth is they may really be magnifying the Lord's presence in your life. Disciples, I pray that you've been blessed. This powerful word, have your notes, go over your notes, go over those words, those terms. You should have wrote down reverence, submission, uh, affliction, mis mystery, the word suffering. And as a believer, I think your work should be over the next five or six days writing an understanding that you can keep within your own spirit about the privilege of suffering. Be blessed in Jesus name. Believers, we're so excited on this upcoming weekend, we will be observing on Sunday, May the 3rd, our second annual communion. 
we're excited in this season. We're not waiting to come back into our physical building. We're going to have our second, this is historical for the city of joy, virtual communion. So that means that those persons who support us and you're with us at city of joy, we're encouraging you this week. If you can go out to the grocery store, if you're not in our immediate area and you can grab some juice, grab some crackers. And on this Sunday after I minister, we will partake in the Lord's supper together. To all of the City of Joy Nation that is local in the DMV, we want to let you know that on this Saturday, the 2nd of May, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the City of Joy campus, we will be distributing pre-packaged communion kits. We will have a drive through for you to pick up pre-packaged communion kits. Deacons will be there to receive you so that you can receive it. Remember, we are following the laws of the land. Our awesome Governor Hogan is leading us through this process. And so when you come, you need to have your PPP on, PPE on. They're going to extend to you the communion kit of what you need, and you're going to receive one anointed oil that has been consecrated for over 40 days and you're gonna anoint your front door, your back door, anoint yourself and the rooms in your house. So we look forward, believers of the City of Joy, of seeing you not only Saturday for those picking up your prepackaged communion kits, but all of our persons who connect with our church on our virtual communion on YouTube and Facebook as we lift up the name of God through eating his body and drinking his blood. Be blessed.